Guess what day it is? Oh, oh. It's French Friday, it's French Friday, so grab your fries and say hooray! David French is here to play on French Friday! It's French Friday! Mr. French, welcome back. Well, thanks so much for having me. Always enjoy talking to you. Um, it's a busy summer with... Oh, gosh. Uh, a looming indictment for another looming indictment, I should say, for the former president. We're keeping an eye on that. Um, but I want to begin with a not directly related story, but we're on the edge here of the beginning of the real hot beginning of the campaign season with the first Republican debate coming up in a few weeks. There's lots of speculation about people entering or leaving the Republican fold right now. So big news out of the DeSantis campaign this week is he's laying off a bunch of his workers because they're retooling after a pretty bad start to, to his election campaign. And one of the guys that got canned is this younger staffer named Nate Hodgman. Um, can you just share with us kind of the story that has engulfed this this guy recently and then it'll launch us into the bigger story I want to talk about? Yeah, it's a tangled backstory. So Nate's a kind of a rising star, a young guy in his mid-20s, I think, a rising star in the sort of so-called new right. So he actually interned for the dispatch at one point. Mm. Um, and then he went and I believe interned at National Review before he became full-time at National Review and then left National Review to work for the DeSantis campaign, uh, I believe, in, in, in the speechwriting capacity. So now what's that sounds like a kind of typical young conservative career arc. So what's notable? Well, what's notable is that Nate was always, uh, you know, even earlier when I first met him, was what I would call sort of like new right curious, if that makes sense. In other words, kind of, intrigued by this world of greater state authority and more aggressive culture warring. Um, yeah, for those who aren't as familiar with the lingo, when you say new right, you mean the the more illiberal right, yes. the more authoritarian right. Yes, yes. So that that's a kind of a term of art that's emerged really since the Trump era to distinguish from the Reagan right. Now, What's interesting about the term new right is it's actually kind of the old right. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm realizing, especially if you read uh, Matthew Continetti's really good recent book about sort of the an intellectual history of like the last hundred years or so of the American right, is that the American right wasn't always the Reagan right. Um, in other words, more libertarian in its economic view, along with being socially conservative and along with sort of being... I don't want to use the term globalist, but very internationally focused in from a national security standpoint, international alliances, mm -hmm. international relationships, free trade. And that was kind of the Reagan GOP. And it displaced something else, something that was called paleoconservatism at one point, which was low on the carbohydrates. Yeah, which was much more isolationist, much more focused on state authority, much more focused on state power, not at all libertarian in its sort of world outlook, or its, its worldview. And then, so the new right is the term of art for kind of the old pre-Reagan right. And it's more authoritarian, it's more isolationist, it's very culture war focused. Um, and so he was always new right curious. And then the new right, though, is something a little different from classic paleoconservatism in that it's also very, 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 very online. So this is a world... As, as most things in the younger generation are. Yes. So this is a world of memes and its own lingo and its own sort of like there there are symbols and, and images that people can use and you can tell immediately when they use them, this guy's in the new right world. And I use the term guy intentionally because it's heavily disproportionately young dudes. And so right. um, a, a last year, last summer, uh, one of our reporters at the dispatch named Alec Dent sort of wrote a, a did a deep dive into this new young new right scene in Washington. And it's very edgy. It's very meme. <laughs> it uh, is very, and then it, at the same time, it's it's both elitist and claims to speak for the working class. It was a really good, it was a really good piece, and it included an element where uh, Nate, who was 
One of the rising stars, as I said, in this group had been on a recorded call or not call, but like Twitter spaces type event with Nick Fuentes. And so Nick Fuentes, if you know who he is, is probably sort of the leading, and this is a dark but accurate description, would be like the leading young white supremacist in America. Holocaust denier. I mean- Yeah, and he sparked some controversy when he, I think, had a meal or did something with Donald Trump down yeah, at Mar-a-Lago, and, and, yeah. mm-hmm. and people were criticizing Trump for even sitting down with this guy. But of course, Trump being flattered by anybody who will stroke his ego He'll, didn't recognize yeah. the problem. But this guy's really, really, really bad. I mean, this, this, there's no ambiguity here about his white supremacy. There's no ambiguity yeah. here about his anti-Semitism. It is just up in your face. And in this call, uh, Nate said many good things about Nick Fuentes. I mean, to be clear, he was also critiquing him in some ways, but he said that he was better for young conservatives, for example, to listen to than Ben Shapiro. Uh, agreed with him on some really over-the-top uh, commentary about sort of the role of women in politics, um, gave him credit for getting a lot of young people, quote, based, uh, which is sort of new right lingo for if you're uh, perceived to be edgy or transgressive in a, in a, in a, um, and they mean it in a positive sense, that you're transgressing liberal norms, you're defying liberal um narratives that makes you based. And so he gave gave Fuentes credit for um, making young people based. And so we reported this. It was newsworthy because here's somebody who's one of the leading avatar, younger avatars of the new right. So we reported this contact with Fuentes and his comments about Fuentes and people on the right got really, really, really angry at us, <laughs> at the dispatch. Shoot the messenger. Yes. Yeah. Accused of so, are trying to cancel him and all of this stuff. But we're reporting things that he actually said. Fast forward, he, he has a full-time job at National Review. After all of this comes out, DeSantis hires him. So DeSantis hires the dude after it's come out that he said a bunch of good things about Nick Fuentes. And then it turns out that um, fast forward again to this month, and there's this really weird video that is put out by this obscure Twitter account called DeSantis Com or something like that, DeSantis Cam, and he retweets it. And it, when I say a really weird video, I mean a really weird video. It features very new right meme stuff like the Wojak character. And again, it's just kind of hard to explain it all, but you'd have to sort of see the video, but it's a kind of a cartoon character who's very sad about Trump and then gets very happy about DeSantis. And, but what is he happy about with DeSantis? It's like all of DeSantis's authoritarian moves that he's made to violate the constitutional rights of Floridians. And then th- at the very end, it morphs into, the video morphs into a line of troops and like the Florida flag morphs into the Sonnenrad. <laughs> so the Sonnen, and then DeSantis's image comes over top of it. So what is the Sonnenrad? Well, the Sonnenrad is a fascist symbol. <laughs> so it turns, this video, he, which he retweets, turns out he created it. He created Oh, I didn't hear that part. It. Yes. So this is his video. And Great. now he then is, leaves the DeSantis campaign. We don't know if he's fired because of it or cost cutting or whatever. And it became a thing for, you know, the last 24, 48 hours as a, as a, a sort of a, not just a newsworthy story in that a speechwriter for one of the leading GOP candidates has created a fascist video of his candidate. <laughs> um, but also, what does it say about kind of the larger New Right project? Because this is not the first person to be exposed like this. Okay, yeah, and obviously that's where I want to go rather than talk specifically yeah, about right. one guy. Um, it, it feels normal and natural to me, whether you're talking about a religious movement or a political movement or a party, that a younger generation comes along and they look at their 
parent parents generation and they say well what did they get right what did they get wrong where are they failing where are they striving and then you course correct or you react in some cases in an unhealthy way so if reagan republicanism dominated the last 40 years of the republican party and some people perceive it to have you know blown it shot or it's right. you know fallen out of favor i could see a younger generation coming along going well let's make some tweaks let's let's rethink that globalist posture let's yeah. let's rethink some of the you know whatever the immigration posture but what we're seeing in the new right the the misogyny the racism the fascism all of that is that a bug of this new right it's that got f- laced into this reaction or is this a feature no it's that it, is pre- it is in many ways the thing so let let me let me backtrack a little bit first it is not new to critique reagan conservatism in other sure. so uh, even on the right and so there was some really interesting and thoughtful stuff that was put out by Ramesh Panuru, Ross Douthat, Rahan Salam, and the years before the rise of Trump. And I believe they called it Sam's Club conservatism, where they mm-hmm. were really trying to reorient the GOP towards being a party of the working class and families. And, you know, sad to say, I mean, they offered a lot of really thoughtful ideas and sad to say when they offered them, the culture of the GOP was very intolerant against any sort of ideological dissent. And so they they got pummeled an awful lot yeah. by sort of the guardians of Reagan conservatism. And that's a real shame because they offered some really thoughtful policy ideas. That's not what we're talking about here. So this young new right might have policy ideas and it might have some policy ideas that I even agree with, but the ethos of it is almost entirely reactionary and culture war focused. It is extremely focused around being anti-woke. And so, and it's extremely focused around being transgressive. Okay, so what does that mean? Look, there are lots of things to critique about say wokeness right there are lots of things to critique about extreme leftism uh leftist illiberalism there are a lot of things to say about that i've written about it a lot i've litigated against it so it's not that you're sitting there saying well if i'm critiquing sort of the far left that there's something inherently wrong with it but it has really become an ethos of i want to be intentionally provocative and intentionally uh, offensive has become a lot of the ethos. Is, is part of it, going back to what you mentioned earlier, that this generation is engaging it online. Mm-hmm. Part of online engagement, sadly, is it's a very noisy environment. Right. There's millions, billions of people on, on these platforms. And the way to get noticed is by being more obnoxious, more offensive, louder, saying the more crazy thing. Has that just been built into the political formation of these young people now where of course extremism is the is it's the coin of the realm we have to use it to get any attention but then the byproduct is you get guys like this working in one of the leading presidential campaigns putting out fascist videos and they just don't recognize the problem anymore yeah i i that's a really good point i I would say this i would say what's ended up happening so gins let's put it this way these folks are a major outlier in gen z (laughs) This is not the Gen Z culture that they are manifesting here. There's sure, but the, the, what is what they are reacting to is this perception that there are, you can't that speech cannot that speech on matters of race or sexual orientation or gender identity is very problematic, and that if you disagree with quote unquote the narrative, then you're going to face quote cancel culture. And so what they've essentially tried to done instead of sort of saying, okay, what's happening on the left is wrong and here's what's right. What they've started to do is say, what's happening, the left is really gone too far. And my response to that is to intentionally enrage them as much as possible. I, whatever they're for, I'm against. It's the own the libs strategy. Drink liberal tears, et cetera, et cetera. And right. so it becomes in many ways sort of purely reactionary. And if you're already divorced from sort of the more libertarian ideas of Reagan conservatism, that has a policy implication and it has a cultural implication. So the policy implication is 
you get more authoritarian because you want to crush your enemy, you want to silence your enemy. And this is what you see out of sort of the DeSantis Florida, whether it's the Stop Woke Act regulating university professors and private corporations, or it's the retaliation against Disney, or it's him saying, I'm going to explore a shareholder derivative suit against Bud Light. It's all trying to bring the power of the state to bear against your enemies. So that's the policy aspect. And then the cultural aspect is, for lack of a better term, just a constant middle finger to the left, just constant. Now, so oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you're totally defining yourself then by what is it that enrages the left, you can begin to see how, especially on matters of race and sexual orientation, this can start to really veer into some dark places. And so if the left is being perceived as, well, they're, t- they're anti-racist, well, reactionary, a reaction to that can become what? Racist, <laughs> you know, really fast. Yeah, it just, it, it strikes me as so incredibly juvenile. Oh, it is. To think, to think my political opponent is anti-racist so therefore i should be racist like there's about 400 steps before becoming racist that you can use to critique some of the more progressive ideas on the left without actually embracing racism um i just yesterday interviewed christine emba about her recent article about the lostness of men in our society that'll be for an upcoming episode of the holy post but she talked about how There is a crisis of masculinity in our culture and the left being more feminist doesn't want to talk about it because it feels like it would take away from a feminist agenda. So they're silent on it, meaning the only voices who are talking about it are coming from the extreme right. And it seems like a lot of these new right young men are very much in league with that side of it, but it tends to be a toxic vision of masculinity. Again, if my political opponent is feminist, it's not enough for me to critique feminism. I have to be aggressively masculine in all the worst possible stereotypes. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, people who are listening to this would object and get really mad. Some of the folks on the new right say, we're not being racist. We're transgressing narratives. We're being provocative. Okay. It's a prophetic kind of thing. Well, but the problem is what keeps happening is that a lot of these um, private communications or actions undertaken in private are now becoming public. So we're now learning that, you know, the Nate Hockman Hockman character, he created this video, which ends with fascism. Or there was another guy who's kind of prominent on the new right named Pedro Gonzalez, who's, um, you know, pretty big on Twitter. And a lot of his private communications leaked. And it was unbelievably racist and anti-Semitic. We've seen people like a guy named Darren Beatty, some of his stuff leak, and he, as a result, was, uh, I believe he was in the Trump administration, not in, and was asked to leave, but then becomes kind of a, a go-to voice for Tucker. Um, and you can just go down the line, this just keeps happening. And then, then there's the whole other aspect of this, which is the Christian nationalist part of the new right, where right. there have been some pretty gross racial controversies in that world as well. And it just keeps popping up to the point where you think, wait a minute, um, your argument that there might be one or two bad apples is beginning to lose credibility because a lot of what you're seeing is as soon as the rock is lifted or when people sort of tweet or stay, you know, or, or make arguments, um, Increasingly, as you're seeing on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it now, a lot of this stuff is just kind of all leaking out at once. And it's all along this common theme that is either explicitly racist or wrapping both arms around people who are explicitly racist. Okay, so it it was one thing when these guys were high school, college age, or they're incels in their parents' basement, (laughs) immersing themselves in video games and porn and online chat forums or whatever. But we're now seeing that as these these guys get older and they get more experience, they're popping up in places like National Review and the DeSantis campaign and appointed roles in, in government and administrations. If this continues, where do you see it going for the Republican Party 
and is there any way to to curtail this yeah it's a really it's a really good question so there was this very interesting piece in the post by greg Sargent taking a look at a lot of generation generational data and what Sargent noted was that Look, the Gen Z generation, this is the generation that is producing a lot of these new right figures, is way left to previous generations. That that essentially what's happened is that it's always been somewhat exaggerated how how leftist young people are, Um, in part because it's more left young people who tend to join mainstream media or whatever, and their kind of portrayal of their own generation becomes dominant. But if you look at their own... If you look at the larger data, the leftism of the young has long been exaggerated. Um, and then even in the baby boom generation, which you know was protesting Vietnam, a majority of young people voted for Nixon over McGovern. Um, and so the leftism of the young has been exaggerated until recently, until recently. Yeah, and, and I wonder if part of that is Gen Z is far enough removed from the Cold War that they don't have the stigma on left ideas that I think a lot of prior American generations did. Even, even those who didn't have a lived experience of the Cold War, it was, there was a residue of it. But that seems gone now. Oh, I think it's a couple of things. Because if you look at the data, there's an inflection point, and that's Trump's election. And so right. you have Gen Z, which is not nursing a lot of the historical grievances that right-wing baby boomers nurse. Um, that have not been immersed kind of in this right-wing infotainment culture that helped um, give birth to Donald Trump. And so they look at Trump and don't see anything appealing about him at all. They don't have the history with him as a celebrity that a lot of older Americans had. And we underestimate how important that was. I mean, if your main exposure to Donald Trump was The Apprentice, you would see him one way. If your main and only exposure to Donald Trump is through his presidency, you're going to see him another way. And right. so, and then the other thing that's going on, so you have Donald Trump rising, and then you have the right-wing youth movement or the effort to influence the right. Young people on the right has come through institutions like Turning Point USA or The Daily Wire, which really emphasize this aggressive pugilism in intentional provocation. Now, um, and so what does that, that aggressive pugilism and intentional provocation does appeal to a subset of young people. It does not appeal to the whole. (laughs) And it will actually end up driving more of them further to the left. Exactly. So this gets into social identity theory, which essentially argues that when, when something core to your identity feels threatened or attacked it makes you emphasize that aspect of your identity even more yeah um so going back to the well people on the far left are anti-racist and if i feel like they might be subtly implying that i'm a racist well maybe i'll just flat out embrace that as a as a way of differentiating differentiating myself and um sticking it to my political enemy or um this this idea of masculinity being challenged through transgenderism or other things. Now there's this hyper masculinity that's Mm -hmm. come out that is being embraced. It's that social identity theory. I feel threatened. So I'm going to triple down on that identity piece that people don't like about me. So the new right, uh, with daily wire or these other outlets are putting out all this stuff and they're getting a ton of money. They're finding an audience, but they may not perceive just how much they're driving more and more young people to the extreme left. Right. But then that feeds the other way and it pushes more people to the extreme right. Well, what ends up happening is you can build a really profitable business off a minority of people in this country. So, right. you know, if it's a nation of 335 million or you have a generation, say, of 40 million, if you can pull in one or two million eyeballs out of that, you've you've got a lot to work with there from a financial standpoint, from a public visibility standpoint. But you're still going to be from an electoral or cultural position, very much in the minority. But if you're raising money, especially from sort of older boomers who are really frustrated about reaching the young, you can say, look, we have a full conference here at TPUSA. We have all of the, we're, we have 
lots of people listen to our podcast. And now, you know, I don't want to conflate everyone in this new right, but essentially what ends up happening then is you have this this message that's being sent that we're the we're reaching young people on the right. Well, yeah, you're reaching a sliver of them, enough of them to really sort of build a business and fill convention halls and all of this, but you're still only right. reaching a sliver. And then you have this culture that on in the online right called no enemies to the right. So this is a this is sort of an ethos that you'll see again on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it, where you're never going to if you're one if you always will criticize publicly to your left, and you will never criticize publicly to your right. Okay, so what does that end up doing? It drives people further off the deep end, because if you're somebody who is in this right wing subculture. The only way you're going to get critiqued is if to your to somebody's left. So you don't want to face that. So what ends up happening is you just keep moving further and further and further to the right so that nobody is outflanking you to the right. And you wow. you see this steady progression and and we've seen it sky in so many things. Let, let's let's remove it from race, for example. We've gone from hey, I'm against vaccine mandates to I think the COVID vaccine is a problem in general to vaccines are a problem to DeSantis yesterday saying Robert F. Kennedy, I'm, I might sick him on the CDC. And, you're, and you just see that progression and, and you'll see it on issue after issue after issue. So on the right, it could be something like, I would agree with, which says, wait a minute, there's a lot of illiberal intolerance on sort of the the uh, illiberal left. And there's ways in which a lot of sort of the anti-racist ethos um, really challenges American liberal norms on the far left. And you can say, hey, there's a problem here. But then that's not enough because then somebody's on your right saying, well, you're not going far enough. It's one thing to critique critical race theory. We have to ban critical race theory. And then right. you see how it goes. Yeah. So uh, to begin to wrap this up, um, based on that understanding of what's going on, should we sort of just sit back and let this thing burn itself out because it's going to keep appealing to a smaller and smaller segment of extreme, uh, an extreme minority of voters or the population, and it can't move elections it's not going to win nationwide office it's not going to really have that deep an impact so just let it go and hopefully it runs out of oxygen or is that the wrong strategy because it can still do a huge amount of damage i think it's the wrong strategy because it can do a huge amount of damage because here here's what i'm seeing happening i do think it's absolutely correct that the right is isolating itself now that if you start it used to be if you're looking at polling data, you'd have the right all the way in one place, you'd have the left all the way in another place, and then independence would be pretty roughly split, right? You're beginning to see that change to where you have the right moving further and further to right and alienating that independent block right. just as it's already, you know, of course, been separate from Democrats. So yeah, I think I agree with you that in many ways the right is isolating itself. Here's the problem, though, Sky extremist minorities can do a massive amount of damage to a culture. And if those extremist minorities dominate one of our two political parties, they're always at risk of gaining power because people who are frustrated with the main party will only have, who are frustrated with the Democrats, will only have the Republicans to pull the lever for in their minds as a form of accountability. So if you're an extremist movement and you dominate one of our two political parties, you're always on the verge of power in a closely divided country. And we can't just sort of assume that, well, people will see through this and continue to vote Democratic, even if they're discontent with the direction of the country. So, okay, David, what happens? What, I mean, if you could predict, based on your understanding of history and trends, is this a case where the Republican Party as we know it fizzles out like the Whigs? And you see the Democratic Party get such a broad coalition that it ends up fracturing into two parties. You know, the, a, a left 
party and a more centrist party. And that becomes the new duality of American politics, as has happened a few times in our past. Or are we just stuck in this, you know, both parties moving further and further to their flanks and most Americans feeling like, oh, my gosh, what's happened? Yeah. So first caveat, gosh, I I don't know. Second, but I'll (laughs) I'll give you my best guess. So Okay, best guess. We won't hold you to it. Yeah, my best guess is, look, I do not, I think that the Democrats, especially the white Democrats, moved way left during the Trump years. Okay, this is documented. White progressives moved way left. Right. But you know who did not move way left during the during the Trump years was non white Democrats. And so there's I'm seeing this dawning realization amongst smarter Democrats. It's like, wait, we can't do this. We cannot go into the defund the police territory. We you know, sort of the extreme edges of sort of like the trans movement where you're talking about sort of bio, you know, natal males participating in women's sports. And you're beginning yeah, to see- we talked about this stuff. Yeah, right. so you're beginning to see within the Democratic coalition, wait, whoa, let's tap the brakes. And the people who are arguing in the Democratic coalition that you have to tap the brakes have a lot more internal sway than the people in the Republican coalition who are saying we need to tap the brakes on all this Trump stuff, right? Right, because most of them have left already. Right, which is one of the reasons why Biden won by 7 million votes, even though he barely campaigned. (laughs) You know, so, so there's evidence that the Democratic Party has realized that its left wing could really, really hurt it electorally. And there is not that corresponding evidence on the right that there's a critical mass of people on the right that understand that the MAGA wing are really, really, really going to hurt the party. Uh, Now, there are voices, but they, as of now, have very little say in Republican primary politics. Right. And so that's that's our current dynamic. Um, The problem that's overlaying on top of that is it's not that... Americans are looking at this dynamic and saying, well, Republicans are out in the cold until they get their act together. They're not doing that. What they are saying is, well, Republicans aren't winning as much as they otherwise could, which is not the same message. (laughs) And so so we're, we're sitting here in a position where because the Republican Party is perceived as the only alternative to a party that is running American politics, but most Americans think is not necessarily doing a great job, that makes this so fraught. Uh, that, that makes this so dangerous. This episode of The Holy Post is sponsored by Haya Health. Hey, do you have kids? Do you care about their health? Of course you do. Most kids' vitamins are basically candy in disguise, filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk kids really shouldn't be eating. That's why Haya was created, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin for kids. Zero sugar, zero gummy junk, yet they taste great and are perfect for picky eaters. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diet to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you need to go to HayaHealth.com slash Holy Post. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash Holy Post and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into health. The adults. And thanks to Haya Health for sponsoring this episode. All right. Well, on that note, um, <laughs> <laughs> that cheery, optimistic view of the future, uh, let's transition to another apocalyptic theme, which is a movie that's just come out that you and I have both seen separately, obviously, because you're in Nashville, I'm in Chicago, and that's the Oppenheimer film. Yes. I know you've tweeted about this or Xed about it, whatever we're calling that now. Yeah. Um, and so I, I haven't looked closely at your take on this, but I wanted to hear, I know you you and I have talked movies in the past. Um, I'm guessing we both think, think it's a brilliant movie and we probably love Christopher Nolan's stuff. 
I want to talk about the film itself, but then I want to also talk about what lessons you think this film has for our current moment. Yeah. But let's start with the movie. Like your high altitude takeaways, what were what would you leave the theater with? Well, first you have to know I'm a I'm a Christopher Nolan fanboy. Like I've never seen a Nolan movie that I didn't like. Including the Nolan movies I don't fully understand. <laughs> like Tenet? Like Tenet. To this yeah. day, if you ask me to explain Tenet to you, I'm out. Like, Yeah, I can't either. But I enjoyed it. Um, so I really in, just, as, just flat out loved the movie. Loved the way it was framed through this really interesting prism that was both forward looking and backward looking. If, you, if you're familiar with Nolan at all, he likes Nothing to mess with time. Yes. Yeah. So the framing of the movie is here you're looking at an Oppenheimer as he's building the bomb, but also you're looking at American politics through the prism of a of a, confirm, a cabinet confirmation hearing in the Eisenhower era, era as it's looking backwards at the decision to, bomb, to build the bomb, use the bomb. And also, interestingly, what's hovering over the whole film is the super bomb, the hydrogen bomb the, that... That, which is the kind of bomb that now dominates our nuclear arsenal now, the much more powerful. All of that was just masterfully done. And yeah. And look, I mean, the acting, I saw it on IMAX, even though it's a talk movie. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, but it was so fun to see it in IMAX because the total, the whole, with, with Nolan, a movie isn't just it's a full sensory experience. It's the music, yeah. it's the images, it's the everything. And so, look, I'm a fan, Sky. I just thought it was a masterfully done movie. It's three hours long. I felt like it was 90 minutes. Um, and I love that he didn't turn this into a CGI fest. Mm -hmm. So there's a way that you could do a, a movie, even that's about building the bomb, where you do things like have tons of footage of the fire bombings of the Japanese cities or you have tons of footage of the actual Hiroshima and Nagasaki attacks, or you intersperse war footage so you get that kind of like big CGI generated sweeping war epic. It's not that, which doesn't yeah. make it boring. It's still right. Re yeah. I mean, you know, the, the movie's based on the book American Prometheus, which is a biography of, of Oppenheimer. And I was a little bit, I knew that there wasn't CGI. I was surprised at, I don't know if the word's restraint, but we don't see any images of the impact of the bombs on Nagasaki or Hiroshima. We don't see those, you know, you can look them up. There's lots mm -hmm. of images online, black and white photographs of victims, Japanese victims. And you know, it, I thought I was expecting some of that yeah. to be put into this movie. It's not there. And it, I don't, it's clearly not because Nolan is trying to diminish no. the horrors. Quite the of opposite. What, quite the opposite. But the, the emphasis of the film is on the psychological trauma yep. of Oppenheimer himself. And so you are inside this guy's head and dealing with his his demons before, during, and after from his young adulthood all the way through later in life. And... It's a psychological movie more than a technological movie. In fact, I went with my son, and one of the things he said to me afterwards as, we, as I was filling in more of the gaps in the history for him is he, he said, I'm kind of curious to know more about how they actually made the bomb. Like, what were the technical challenges that they were up against that they had to overcome? The film doesn't really get into mm -hmm. that much mm -hmm. at all because it's, it's, it's about the psychology, mm -hmm. not the technology. Yeah. That's what I found most interesting about it. And I was talking to somebody just yesterday about Nolan's decision not to show the carnage created by the bomb. Mm -hmm. But in a way that's even more powerful because what it does is you watch as Oppenheimer in the immediate aftermath of the bomb um, is kind of imagining it. And right. he's hearing the screams in his head and he there's some moments, there are some visual moments, but you kind of walk with him as he's imagining what the bomb did. And in many ways, at least for me, I've seen a ton of footage of the bombing. I've seen the photos of the aftermath, including many of the grim, grim, really grim photos. But I found the imagining of it more jolting in many ways than the images. And so I don't think it in yeah. any way diminished in any way diminished the 
moral gravity of the entire decision. Right. Um, let's talk about what are the lessons we're supposed to take from this, whether Nolan intended them or we're just finding them ourselves. Uh, at one point, and this is not really a spoiler because I think it's been in some of the trailers and, and bits that are out there. Before they're about to test the bomb, Oppenheimer shares with his uh, military you know, superior that, hey, there's, there's a non-zero chance here that we might destroy the world when we <laughs> test this bomb because some calculations indicate that it could start a chain reaction, that it ignites the entire atmosphere of the planet. And they go to to Einstein and others to kind of check the math and see is this going to happen or not and they're, they're fairly confident it won't but they're not entirely sure but by the end of the movie it comes back to that idea and Oppenheimer essentially says I think we may have ignited this I don't know if this exact quote but I think yeah. we may have started a chain reaction anyway it's, it's just not the one I thought it, it was a chain yeah. reaction of, of the arms race mm -hmm. that would perhaps eventually destroy the whole world and that's that was a haunting idea at the end of the movie and yes. even the raindrops you yes. know, on the water and, the, and the, the ripples and then having that superimposed on the map as these different cities are illustrated and the potential of, of a, a new hitting them. Um, is that, does you think that message still resonates today in a post-Cold War environment where I don't know if a generation grown up after the Cold War thinks about this as a relevant fear? I don't think it would have resonated until the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And then now we're in a situation where the existence of a terrifying nuclear arsenal is directly constraining the world's reaction to an unbelievably vicious act of aggression that would yeah. otherwise be addressed in all likelihood by force of arms, by force of Western arms, in all likelihood, if it were not for this hovering possibility of a nuclear exchange. And so all of a sudden, since February of 2022, we are now front and center on the importance of nuclear arsenals to our life in this world, right? And what I thought Nolan did very well, because it wasn't, it wasn't an anti-nuclear movie. <laughs> Right. It was a movie that I thought did a very good job of fleshing out sort of the competing ideas about it. And so one of the ideas that Oppenheimer himself vocalizes, and again, this is like historical record stuff, right? And so, you know, if you don't want to, if you have no knowledge of any of the history, um, maybe you, you want to hear there's a spoiler alert here. But one of the arguments here is, wait a minute, these things will actually end the kinds of great power conflict that have so tormented this world and cost so many millions of lives that they will make great power conflict unthinkable. And, and the interesting thing is, since 1945, they kind of have a point. Kind of. <laughs> because we have not engaged in great power conflict. And, and so... And why haven't we engaged in great power conflict? Because the consequences of great power conflict are even greater than the horrific consequences that we endured in World War I and that we endured, endured in World War II. These things have True. deterred great power conflict. True, but it has not deterred great power proxy conflicts, right. which have proliferated, especially in the, in the post-colonial world, whether you're talking about Central America... Southeast Asia, various other places, Korea even, um, in the 1950s. So there, it isn't like we have... It doesn't end you know, war. Had, right. It has not ended war. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's partially true, like you said. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think when you're talking about World War II, and this is something that, you know, look, at, we, we just don't have a frame of reference for World War II. Um, yeah. you know, these are people who are looking at, by this point, at least some knowledge of the dimensions of the Holocaust were becoming known. Certainly it was known the dimensions of the atrocities in the Soviet Union, the dimensions of the atrocities in China, what Japan was doing in China, the unbelievable human carnage that people had experienced by 1945. There were, the idea, you know, 
the idea that we we might do this again to to this scale to this extent um was haunting to people and whereas the league of nations faltered after world war one which was supposed to be the war to end all wars because it was so horrific well the un persists so league of nations falters america doesn't join it it proves ineffective but we do have a UN after World War II that the United States does join, which does take the lead role in. There was a lot of reaction to World War II that has stuck with us, um, that didn't stick after World War I. And so in that sense, you know, this idea that can, we, can you use these weapons to deter something like we just endured from 1939 to 1945, has proven viable, but certainly, I don't think any even an Oppenheimer on his wildest moments would say, well, that that the existence of nuclear weapons is going to end war. the The key was, can we not have these nations go after each other again? And that that was sort of that was sort of front of mind, I think. Yeah, the. Um there's some stuff in the film I, I don't I, I haven't given enough thought to it I'm not sure I agree 100% with Oppenheimer and the stuff but I get his his rationing and the, like his rationale the his argument was we have to demonstrate the bomb we actually mm-hmm. have to use it so the world can see its destructive power and fear it mm-hmm. so that it never gets used again um some were arguing, well, why can't you just demonstrate it? Why do you actually have to drop it on a, on a city, on mm-hmm. a population? Which is an interesting argument. Um, but he argued strongly against the development of the H-bomb, which mm-hmm. is a far more potent, destructive uh, version of a nuclear weapon. Um, and he also advocated for sharing knowledge and perhaps even some of the technology of this device with the Soviets mm-hmm. in order to tap down the possibility of an arms race that would accelerate out of control, which gets into the the controversy in the latter part of the movie with with Louis Strauss, 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 mm-hmm. Strauss? Strauss, I believe, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think, was Oppenheimer just naive that oh. once, this, once this thing was created, it was an inevitable arms race, there's no way around it? Or do you think there was an off-ramp option after World War II to handle these weapons differently in a way that would not have led to an inevitable arms race? I think he was naive. I mean, let's not mm. forget who was running the Soviet Union. Joseph sure. Stalin. I mean, right. you know, look, you want to look at history as some of history's greatest, greatest villains. Yeah. Joseph Stalin is right up there. I mean, he's right up there. And so it's sort of this idea that Stalin, Stalin's Soviet Union was going to be sort of our partner it was a marriage of convenience between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union. It was, they, everyone knew the score between these two civiliz- you know, these two civilizational yeah. forces. And that some idea that, that Stalin was going to respond to American overtures, he would respond if it gave him an advantage in the moment. Uh, well, the, the uh the naivete was also present with Truman, though, because he thought the Soviets will never get the bomb. They'll never oh, have this technology. Crazy. And, and yeah, and Oppenheimer <laughs> knew they have scientists, too. Mm-hmm. They're not stupid. Mm-hmm. This, this science has been developed. It was only a matter of time. Yeah. And it turned out to be four years before mm-hmm. they had it. It wasn't that much time. Yeah. No, I know. I mean, that was one thing that was really interesting was sort of this, the, the idea, per, you know, that this, we, could, we could have a nuclear monopoly right was never going to happen it was absolutely never going to happen but that attitude still exists in the world there is still a a belief that well iran will never will never get this and okay north korea has it but they're not going to be able to use it they're not gonna be able to launch it the way they would like to so uh are are we still living in that sort of truman naivete i don't think we are living in it i think that we have long shed as a generally as long shed our naivete and have realized that because from the beginning non-proliferation wasn't just a matter of agreement it was a matter of power right it was enforced yes and so it was i think people who are clear-eyed about nuclear weapons never thought 
oh, kumbaya, everyone's going to get together and realize these things are too terrible to develop. Instead, mm -hmm. the deterrence against developing nuclear weapons was going to be rooted in both persuasion and coercion. And so part of this is the Iran nuclear deal during the Obama era. That was an example of trying to use persuasion. When the Trump team canceled the nuclear deal with Iran, they tried to move towards coercion, that we're going to prevent you from getting the bomb rather than sort of coax you away from the bomb. And so you've had this carrot and stick approach around the world for a long time, but it's crumbling. So you had Pakistan work towards creating a, a bomb and India answers, right? You have North Korea, and, and one of the things, North Korea develops a bomb. And so one of the things that I think people need to realize, just to pull this back full circle to our new right conversation, the more America recedes from the world as a guarantor of security and, and through its web of alliances, the greater the incentive to create to for nuclear prolifer proliferation. So for example, um, if you're Ukraine, if you, you're sitting there thinking even a couple of dozen nuclear weapons would have prevented this horror. You know, yeah. if we, if we just had 10 or 20 nuclear weapons, it would have prevented this horror. Or if you're South Korea and you're saying, my goodness, I don't know if I can count on American support anymore. Well, South Korea could break out to a bomb so fast. I mean, this is, remember, 1945 technology. Mm -hmm. or, and it, it, you begin to realize why, if you have this, this view of American foreign policy, like we're overextended, we're out there too much, when you begin to think through the consequences of pulling back and you walk into the shoes of, say, Saudis or South Koreans, or Ukrainians, or you name it, and and you start to think through their security dilemma, you begin to realize, well, why is it that we were there in the first place? It wasn't just because of our desire for hegemony, right? It, you know, so it's a, it makes it well, things and, very complicated. And this is sort of the brilliance of NATO, yes. because by joining NATO, if Ukraine had joined NATO, then they wouldn't have to have these weapons themselves exactly. because they would be protected by ours yes. under, under um, uh, diplomatic agreement. But, um, okay, going back to the movie yeah. before we wrap up here and sort of the psychology of the movie rather than just the techno technology. But one of the big things I walked away with, and I think this is to Nolan's credit, it's easy to think that history is driven by m major advances in technology or, or major you know battles on the battlefield or, or big events in, in world-changing catastrophic uh, happenings or whatever it's, and yet when you really drill down into this movie you realize so much of the world we occupy is the result of the inner insecurities and foibles of broken people yeah so uh, obviously, the movie explores deeply Oppenheimer's own demons and struggles and, and craziness. Um, and, and his own compulsion to create this weapon wasn't merely from a desire to end an atrocious war. No. It was also his ego was deeply involved sure. in, in the yeah. whole thing. But then even after that, in, in the battle that he has sort of politically with uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s character, you realize that so much of the Cold War was driven because of insecurities, fears, ego, and ambition of political leaders. You talked about Stalin on one hand, and mm -hmm. you, know, you have these other. So for me, coming away from the movie, it's, it's both sobering and a little bit terrifying to know that the only thing that separates us from Armageddon isn't just the fact that these weapons exist or that some AI one day could you know, launch them against our will, but it's the fragility of human character. Yeah. Like, it, I mean, the war in Ukraine right now is because Vladimir Putin and whatever warped, malformed character that man has pursued this invasion. And you just it's stunning how much of history hinges on those that the inner soul of very few people. Oh, and it's so much. It's not just bad character. It's also bad information. <laughs> yes. So fair enough. So, for example, if you look, one thing that I found incredibly compelling about the movie was the way 
it accurately portrayed the singularity of the Nazi threat. So you had these characters, especially early in the movie, who would have qualms, but once you said the Nazis are pursuing this and they're ahead, all qualms go away. Right. Because if that is true, that A, the Nazis are pursuing it, and B, the Nazis are ahead, then that bulldozes everything because you know that Hitler will have absolutely no qualms about using that weapon. None. And Mm -hmm. so, therefore, this imperative to get there before him just starts to overwhelm everything. And, And, you know, I would say... I would say, yeah, like my my view on it, looking back and is if I'm a, a person in 1942 or 43, and I, let's say I'm a world leading physicist and I've got real qualms about the war and the carnage and everything that is happening and really worried about what's happening to our world. If I hear the Nazis are developing a bomb and they're a year ahead, I'm like, where do I sign to get there before them? Yeah. and. And I think that was really important to show because I think when we look back at World War II, we are very bad at putting ourselves in their shoes because we look at in our, the Allied victory and see it as an, in hindsight as an inevitability. The Nazis, yeah. in fact, were not ahead of us. They had shot themselves in the foot with their own anti-Semitism, as, as Oppenheimer lays out in the movie. Um, the Japanese were nowhere near a bomb, like just nowhere in the universe near getting a bomb. So in hindsight, our big race to it isn't as justifiable as it was in the present tense. But in the present tense, honestly, honestly, what was the argument against it in the present tense, right? Basing on all the information and all that they were experiencing. And I thought the movie was very effective at portraying that. Yeah, I agree. And and when you think, I mean, it all was kicked off when when Einstein wrote a letter to President Roosevelt, and ba- try, basically explained the science has shown through quantum mechanics that this kind of a weapon is possible. Yeah, and someone's going to make it. Yeah. So even if the Manhattan Project hadn't happened, even if World War II had not concluded with these two bombs being dropped, at some point the science was there. Yeah. Somebody was going to make these weapons. Um, the fact that it was Oppenheimer who was the point of that spear to get it done, he carried the the burden and guilt of that, but it was inevitable. It, it was, was going to happen. Uh, absolutely. Um, so I, I watched this movie at the same time I've been up to my neck reading John Meacham's new biography of Abraham Lincoln, Let There Be Light, which is brilliant. I love it. Um, but again, it, it reinforces to me how critically important the leadership that leadership is just mm-hmm. and the and the character of the women and men in those roles is so i mean this nation would not be what it is without lincoln yes and we would not have gotten through that period and the civil war without him and his wisdom and the core of his beliefs guiding so much so much of the country um on the flip side when he was assassinated the country would not be what it is today without andrew johnson coming in and and completely screwing up reconstruction um but just knowing we possess the technology to literally destroy the planet and that the use of that technology at some point rests in the character and will and sometimes good or bad information given to people in leadership roles is really frightening. The weak part here, uh, what I'm trying to say is what I came away with was not a fear at this technology. It's a fear of, of humanity's ability to deal with it because of our fragility of, of character and... Mm-hmm. And how long does that hold out? We've had 80 some years uh, where we haven't, thank, thank God, but will it last? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's really, I, I listened to this really interesting podcast discussion on um, uh, between a, a, po- a, military, a, po- a military podcast that I listened to that's really, that's, uh, that's really good and a f- retired British Navy captain who was a captain of a Trident missile submarine. And um, and the podcast is called School of War. Uh, it's a, re- a really good podcast. But anyway, um, between... And so the question was framed, how did you feel 
about being a person who with the turn of a key could end so many lives. Right. Which is a really fair question. And he said, that is not how I viewed my life and my life's work. He said, my life's work was by the fact of being silent and stealthy in the deep of the wa- of the ocean waters, I was saving millions of lives. Because what we have seen, without any doubt, is when great powers go to war, millions die. And my life's work was preventing that war. And it really was this interesting callback, I mean, call forward, I guess, because I heard the podcast, but well before I watched Oppenheimer. But it was a call forward to the exact dynamic and argument we saw play out on that screen. And I thought it was really interesting to hear those two framings coming back and forth to each other. Well, it's that deterrent yeah. thing again. And and now that these weapons exist, it's really the only viable option is deterrence. Because right. unless someone has a brilliant idea for making sure we can eradicate all of these weapons and no one will recreate them. Yeah. But we don't have a great history of developing a technology and then voluntarily not using it, which brings up all kinds of ethical questions about AI, uh, genetic engineering and CRISPR and all these other things that could pretend we've just come out of a global pandemic. There are biological things we can do with technology that could destroy us as Mm -hmm. well. So um, the same ethical dilemma applies to all these human developments of technology that could potentially destroy us. Well, David. Uh, any final thoughts? No final thoughts. It'll be interesting to, uh, we, we are actually recording this on what could well be indictment day. Yes. <laughs> For keep, indictment keep day number three. Keep refreshing your news feed. Yeah, keep refreshing. So uh, a lot of people may actually t- tune into this podcast thinking, I can't wait to hear them talk about the indictment. But Hey, not that you don't have a bazillion other podcasts to do, but if there's an indictment coming out and you just want to come back and talk on the Holy Post about it, I will set that time up with you anytime you want to talk about it. We'll do it for a bonus feature. Um, I, I hope I hope it's as, as substantive as everyone is speculating it will be. Um, but I, I still, I, I have a hard time imagining a jury of 12 Americans convicting Donald Trump of anything. But maybe I'm pessimistic. Oh, I can um, easily imagine it. Can you? Yeah. You don't think you can get a jury with one holdout that just feels like he's getting screwed and this is an unfair prosecution? Oh, I think it's quite possible. But if I, had to, if I had to bet the whole equity of my house on something, I would bet on at least one conviction. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Like with jail time? No, that... <laughs> That's Convic- different. I now, know. So conviction with a sentence of jail time, I can easily imagine. Uh, him actually serving time is a different question that depends on a million different factors. <laughs> right, 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 right. Lots of appeals and on and on. And pardon. Um, okay, one last thing before. And, yeah. Before last, in the last episode of French Friday, we talked about UFOs and all the stuff that had been coming out. Yesterday, there was a congressional hearing with some of the same folks that we had talked about. People online have been asking us for our thoughts on all that. I, I I didn't look at the entire hearing. I kind of read summaries of it, but it basically was repeating stuff that we had already heard. Um, any takeaways on your end on that on the recent hearings and any new thoughts on the UFO thing? It didn't really ex- bring out anything that we hadn't really heard before, as you said. And yeah, I think if anything, I left a little feeling a little less confident in the informant Mm. um you know because he strongly implied that people had been killed to suppress this information right and i don't know that just kind of crossed over a threshold for me like if you're gonna make that kind of claim you kind of got to deliver the goods on it right you know um yeah he did say repeatedly that there he can't disclose that publicly but he would meet with members of congress yeah. in, a, in a skiff or something where he could disclose you know classified information but but by testifying before congress is a little different than going on an internet news show uh he's opening true. himself up to charges of perjury if he's proven to be a liar correct yeah but that's so i mean you know a, a defense to perjury is i thought i was right you know like i th- i you know, there was no intention to mislead. Perjury, yeah, perjury is not 
saying things that turn out not to be true. Right. That is not what perjury is. So um, he's he's in a position where a perjury and a, a perjury prosecution would be just ludicrously difficult. Um, yeah. So and if, if perjury were just saying things that aren't true, then there would be no members of Congress. Right. And I'm so. not at all surprised. I, it would not surprise me at all if he. And I'm and I'm assuming that he is testifying to what he believes to be true. Mm -hmm. That's not the same thing as, you know, that my, my issue is not, is this guy intentionally lying to us? It's, is this guy relaying things that actually happened? That's right. Which is two different questions. He's not claiming to be an eyewitness to this stuff. He's claiming to have investigated and heard from others who are eyewitnesses. So it's one step removed, which, okay. Anyway, David, thank you for your time. Enjoy your indictment. And uh, <laughs> wait, wait, that will... could come out wrong. <laughs> well, enjoy the indictment. Uh, and we will check in with you in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Guy. French Friday is a production of Holy Post Media featuring David French and me, Sky Jatani. Music and theme song by Phil Vischer. This show is made possible by Holy Post patrons. To find out how you can become a Holy Post patron and to find more common good Christian content, go to holypost.com.